Welcome everyone to another episode of the Robin Graham show. So it has been a few months since I actually recorded an interview or an episode for that matter, because I took July and August off from recording. So today is September 8th and I have a guest with me who I think is very special and I'm super excited to bring this topic to you because I think we all have certain levels of conflict in our life and we need to know how to deal with them, but deal with them in a peaceful way and an intelligent way, I guess we could say as well. So I am going to be interviewing today Yvette Durazo. She is an author of Conflict Intelligence. She helps entrepreneurs and organizations experience positive work environments built on trusting relationships. Today, we are going to talk about the fact that you don't have to be afraid of conflict or difficult conversations because you can become conflict intelligent. Without further ado, Yvette Durazo, welcome to The Robin Graham Show. Thank you very much, Robin, for inviting me over to your podcast and to your audience. Thank you. It is a pleasure to have you here. So I gave just a very brief introduction of who you are and the fact that you're the author of the book, Conflict Intelligence or Conflict IQ. Would you just tell the listeners a little bit about your backstory and what inspired you to take the steps to write this book? Yeah, thank you so much. As you probably might have already read in the book, part of my inspiration was my father and he was a self-made man. He was an orphan at the age of seven and he could have been a person that didn't want to achieve anything, but he did. He was a great person. He was a man of faith. And I think that really inspired me to see his leadership where he never had any formal education. He barely went to second grade. And just for me to have the opportunity to have us a playground as I was growing up, his business and experiencing firsthand how he would treat his employees and customers inspired me to look into careers to learn about leadership. And fast forward, I study a bachelor's in international business with emphasis in Latin American studies. And then I went years past, I went on in looking for another master's degree. And I literally fell in love with the field of alternative dispute resolution, which is everything that has to do with helping individuals have how to resolve conflict outside the legal system. And, and also what inspired me is that I also went into working for a lot of nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that well-meaning people were going into these organizations with the idea about helping the community, the business community, but at the same time, like everybody else, they had their own ideas of how is it that they wanted to come in and help the community. And then at the same time, we have different personalities. We have different goals and objectives, right? Of how is it that they're involving themselves in these nonprofit organizations. And I realized that although that ever since I was very young, I was being seek to support and help people to communicate among each other, I always felt that I I didn't have the skill sets. Something was lost and I didn't know what. And then when I started researching master's degrees, I found this field of study in alternative dispute resolution. And I immediately knew that was going to be it. That was my passion. And I went into it. I studied that master's degree at the same time that I was doing my credentials as a coach. Because somehow I knew that this, this skill set was going to become very useful. And it did. Eventually, I finished my degree and I noticed that how useful this had been, right? Because you ha I have the ability to work with groups of people. I have the ability to work independently. And as I was working independently with people, I realized that a lot of people were having fear, especially in the workplace, right? Having fear, not only of conflict, but also being open to the idea that to share that they were afraid of dealing with conflict. I would also work with organizations that they were very concerned about conflict itself. And they didn't want anybody to know that there was conflict inside the organization and things of that nature. And as I was going into this field and becoming a specialist, not only doing my master's degree, but getting myself into every single certification that I could, reading a bunch of books, being a speaker in many of my field associations, 
in order to, to be the best that I could in order to work with people. That's how it came about my passion about bringing peace into the organization, my own personal experiences of going through bullying, micromanagement, I would say unjusted, also feeling, how do you say, also feeling that I wasn't included, also feeling that because of my accent, because of my culture, that I wasn't invited into the table in order to grow my career when I was working for organizations. All of that combination in, in my, my personal experiences is what I bring into this book, my oneness and my pureness of helping professionals and organizations to really create harmonious organizations in where business can do good by doing well in the community, not only in their internal community with their employees, but in the outside community, because that filters out, right? When organizations mm -hmm. are doing great and they treat their employees well, the community knows and the community wants to buy from them, right? But when we hear that organizations are not treating their employees, we try to boycott them. We don't want to buy from them, right? Mm -hmm. So it all goes hand in hand with all of these ideas about helping organizations to really generate and foster a culture of inclusiveness, a, a culture of harmonious workplace relationship. Mm -hmm. Like I said in the book, not all conflict is good. And not all conflict is bad, but at the same time, it's distinguish it and knowing how to transform it. And yeah. that is the key here. Now in the book, I want to say a couple of things about what you said. So I think that the majority of my audience, the listeners who are listening today are along the lines of entrepreneurial journeys, or they maybe are in corporate and they have a side hustle and they're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur full time. And I want to emphasize that even as entrepreneurs, people can have a perception of your business. You are a personal brand, which means people are going to have an opinion about you. They're going to have a perception of you. And if you have a team underneath of you, or if you are a solo person, everything that you do and say is a reflection on your business. And so it is important to present yourself in a way and manage internal relationships alongside external relationships in your community to build that rapport, to build the perception that you want people to have of you and your business. So I just wanted to emphasize that. And I want to say from, I think this is a good segue into when we talk about conflict intelligence, based on what I read in your book, I think it's important to understand emotional intelligence first. And we think of emotional intelligence and I think myself included, it's, oh, it's emotional in intelligence, connecting with other people's emotions and their body language and the response that you sense what they're experiencing in the situ situation, communication, whatever it is. But there is more to it than that. And I would love to just really quickly hit on a couple of those things that people can be in tune with as far as emotional intelligence, and then we'll jump into conflict intelligence and what that actually means and what the methods are for navigating conflict effectively and peacefully. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. And I don't know if you remember reading about a particular person that I coach that I wrote on the book. His name is Pedro. Mm -hmm. He really gave me the epiphany to, to, I had already the idea about writing the book. I was using the methodology with the clients that I was working with, and I was seeing progress. I was seeing the aha moments. I was seeing how is it that people were transforming and how was it useful? But I had the opportunity to work with these clients from a nonprofit organization where I volunteer my service. And again, very similar to the background of my father. He immigrated into the United States and went through hardship and immigrated. And he was a, he was a dishwasher in a restaurant, but he had this dream of creating, and actually he was doing already his little coffee shop business. And while I was coaching this person, at first he would say, I don't think I'm intelligent because I remember when I was going to school all of my other teammates were more, they were more intelligent. They were able to answer things quickly. And I remember being so slow and not being able to answer those things. 
Can I ask him, what has it been from those, those students that you were to go to school with? What has it been of their life? And he retrospect and things and says, not much of it. They're still in the same place where they live. They didn't really amount to much. They didn't build careers or anything. And I said, and what is that comparison from them to you? And look what you have been doing. You went through a, a lot of adversity. You decided to move from a, your hometown to a place where, you know, you don't know anybody, different language. And on top of that, you're trying to build your own business. And then he had his aha moment and said, wow. So indeed I have some intelligence. And I said, yes. And that is called emotional intelligence. You build that emotional intelligence to have resiliency to be able to be self-aware of your emotions and not allow those emotions to hold you back, but help you to move forward. You have the ability to collaborate and work with other people, be sensitive to the emotions of other people, because without that, you wouldn't have a partner in your business. Without that, you wouldn't have the ability that your manager is supporting you for you to have a job watching dishes while you're building your business outside. That is emotional intelligence. And his self-esteem went up the roof. And then on top of that, he was having a little bit of issues of not knowing how to communicate certain things with the, with the partner. And that was a little bit of a conflict in there. And then I started working with him on that. And I said, and this is the next level up. It's your conflict intelligence. Now you're not fearing conflict. Now you're confronting it. You, have, you feel comfortable about it. You know how to transform it. And you learn not to see it as a negative thing, but rather as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So that is a beautiful example of how one person that I coach went through these phases of discovery, of understanding what was IQ, understanding what was emotional intelligence, and then understanding the other portion of it, conflict intelligence. And I've seen these over and over again. I have tested people in emotional intelligence, and I have had quite a lot of people being pretty much in the normal to the high range of emotional intelligence. But they also come to me with the fear of, I don't know how to have this difficult conversation. I don't know how to give feedback to my direct reports. I don't know how to talk to my executive directors about this situation that is happening in this project. And I don't know how to go about saying that. I don't know how to not fear or have this anxiety whenever something arises. I work with those individuals, with those professionals, and they get to learn how not through a framework, because frameworks can also be self-sabotage because you think this framework is going to work for everything. And it is not what I'm teaching them through this methodology is to really go from the inside out, mm -hmm. have this transformation and know how to embrace and know how to not have self-doubt in yes. order to know how to handle things, yeah. which makes a huge distinction between having a skill and being able to do this through a very natural way, right? Mm -hmm. That is what we see in leaders, right? That's what we see in leaders that we admire. And actually in 2013, I referred a lot to a Stanford research that it was done through CEOs that they were interviewed. And one of the things that they said is that they have concern about not knowing how to deal with conflict. And not only that, hiring leadership, hiring employees, they see the lack of the skill in people. And that is because throughout our educational system, if you think about it, you will rarely see or hear that there was a conflict resolution course in your curriculum, perhaps a mediation course. If you get lucky enough, you might've bumped into some mediation or teen mediation program in your schools that now they're starting little by little to implement but we don't have that. The only thing that we have is the experiences of our adults in our lives that we were seeing growing and how is it that they deal with conflict. And then we create a framework and we use that through our life. And that mm -hmm. is the same framework that even though that we have a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD, we bring into the workplace and guess what? That's what gets us in trouble because it's just one framework.
And the more you ascend in leadership, the more you need to have the people skills, the more you're going to be working with people. So there's so many things that you just said. And I want to emphasize that if you grew up in, say, a household where the framework for handling conflict was yelling and screaming, that framework is embedded in your brain. But that doesn't lend to that's your future. The fact is yeah. that the because of neuroplasticity, which is yeah. we can change those neural pathways in our brain, which I love that science. And you guys, the listeners have heard me talk about it before, but we can change the perceptions of every yes. experience that we have. And so this is the type of work. When you build out your emotional intelligence, you can more readily see conflict as it's brewing, so to speak, or arising, and then be able to address it in a more peaceful way. I would love for you to talk about those methods that you talk about in the book. There were, I think, three key methods, self-awareness, retooling the brain, and then behavior modification. And I think that awareness is the platform, the basis for transformation. So I love that you have self-awareness as the first part of that method. So can we dive into that? Yeah. And self-awareness is such a broad spectrum. If you talk to people, I have, I have worked with a lot of people. Yeah. You would ask them, are you self-aware? And they would say, yes, I'm self-aware. Everybody tends to think that we have self-awareness, but it's such a broader space of self-awareness that not everybody has all of the self-awareness, mm -hmm. just like implicit bias. If you oh, have yeah. a brain, you have bias, right? Uh -huh. And you work on your muscle to create awareness in order to reduce that bias, right? You catch mm -hmm. yourself on bias, right? So the same framework goes with the self-awareness. It's, I work with individuals from where they are at the moment that they come to work with me. And mm -hmm. I take them to create awareness of how is it that they deal with conflict themselves. And we go in to the program that that set mindset of how to deal with conflict. And I help them to realize that there's multiple ways that you could perceive things, you can see things that you can deal with conflict. Then uh -huh. we go through the the escalating processes and the escalating processes that they have been doing throughout their life, perhaps they never realized. So mm -hmm. that is the whole process of self-awareness. It's not a very simple process but it takes a while to work with professionals in order to get to that place. And mm -hmm. that's when I see that they're ready for some skill sets. And being a conflict intelligent person, I it's not about one skill here and there. It's a meta skill. It's a multiple set of skills. Some people might have some of these skills already. Some of them haven't, and they're not using it based on the work that they do or the goals that they have to in their workplace or their, their career. And we look into that as well, right? Once we figure that out, that they have the skills, that they understand the skills, that they know how to use certain skills towards these others. You, we have certain skills in one way, but sometimes we forget that we can use it in some other ways. So we go through that self-discovery of skill sets, what they have, what they need, and then we expand from there and then we build that. And then some people... They have enough with that and they can go on to life and be great leaders. Be And I say leaders because I think that every one of us inside the workplace, we're leaders. I know some people don't like to hear that, but I think that if a janitor has the ability to deal with conflict well, to treat people with respect, to be nice to other people, helps with the culture of the organization. Mm -hmm. That person it's, has yeah. woods of being a leader. Have I that think if you're influencing... If you're yes. influencing people in a positive light, then you are a leader. I think yes. we often get distracted by the term leader. Oh, you have to be leading a team. You have to be telling people what to do and teaching people and guiding people. But that is not necessarily what leadership means. So I love that you gave that example. And I think as entrepreneurs, we have that opportunity to lead on many different levels, whether we are hiring a team, hiring a VA, conducting interviews for a podcast, or sending emails to our email list. We have opportunities to lead based on how we're presenting ourselves and the information that we're giving out. I love that you brought that into play. Yeah. So, and, uh, I think that that all comes down to self-awareness and accepting yourself as who you are and being willing to be authentically 
you and genuinely you versus trying to be something that you aren't. And the janitor is a good example. If you're, if you are the custodian of a school, you're not the principal, but if you're trying to behave like you have ownership in the building or you have authority over certain situations, but you don't, then that could create conflict. So that self-awareness is such a great place to start. And then you mentioned retooling the brain. And I'm assuming that I shouldn't assume I'm guessing that when you talk about adapting those skills, that's retooling the brain, adapting those skills so that you're thinking differently and you're reframing how your brain is processing different situations, different interactions and different responses from other people. Yeah. And I go through the process, not only I talk about the skill sets, but I talk about neuroscience. I talk about neuroplasticity because that is embedded in that piece. And then you will have those individuals, those professionals that the skill sets is not enough because somehow throughout their life, they have been rewarded by dealing with conflict in a very negative way. You might have those CEOs that are very aggressive, but they don't get fired. They want them in many organizations because somehow they also do something good, which is bringing Mm -hmm. the money into the organization. How many times have we have seen this in our career life that you see people all the way to the top level and people can be jerks. They can not, they don't treat people well. And the only thing that, that we know is that they keep them up there because they're doing something right. So somehow they're being rewarded. But once the executives are realizing that somehow they're having this leaky bottom line, the one that I talk about in the book. That is very difficult to see because then you have a human resource department and you have a legal counsel inside many organizations that sometimes masquerade those leaky bottom lines because the executive thinks HR will deal with it. We have legal counsel and what they do is just get rid of people and the amount of money that, that it costs to get rid of somebody hire someone, it takes about three to four months to get that person in the role to get training to where they need to get. And then acclimate into the culture. It's a lot of money invested in those instead of working with people, you know, right now I am teaching a course in, in, for HR in conflict resolution, because I went myself in depth into going and getting a certificate. So I just couldn't understand how the history of HR has been built without or leaving outside of the equation, the human. Oh, you, know, you just said all, something. They're all about policies and procedures. Yeah. And, and they I left think, around the, the human. Yeah. We get so legalistic. And this is something I can relate to this on so many levels. But when I was still working in the medical field and I was doing medical writing, it, the regulations and the legalities got to be intense that it took away all creativity and all joy from writing and creatively writing to present information to people. And I see that happening in a lot of businesses. And even when you look at processes and procedures and all of the systems and things that we have to put in place in our businesses, if we aren't looking at the human being and we are only looking at documentation on paper, we're not seeing the full picture. And I think the the work you're doing is so important. And I think looking back at that self-awareness, retooling the brain, and then modifying behaviors based on those changes in the brain and how you're now thinking and recognizing is so much more powerful than following a process and procedure on paper. Yes, all of that is very important. And we have to have the legal formatting and all of those things in place to protect organizations and people. But I think when we're looking at relationships, when we're looking at emotions, we have to look at how do we look at the human being to resolve a conflict versus just looking at the bottom line and protecting the company as a whole. Oh, I like this. I could talk about this stuff forever. Thank you. Yeah, me too. I, this is my field. This is what I'm passionate about. I have had the opportunity to work with departments of equal opportunity. And when I train in this methodology and then I work with the people inside the equal opportunity you have no idea how many of the formal complaints 
get reduced or being distracted back that like they don't, they say, I put a formal complaint, it's not needed anymore mm -hmm. because they address the human side of it. Mm -hmm. But then we have this legal counsel that is constantly fearing the business. You're going to get yeah. sued. It's, something's going to happen. They're well-meaning people. I understand that is all their focus about the legal. And also they like to be paid just like the executives. They don't want to lose business. That's why this field of work that I do, it's not a, it's not a new field. It has been with us for a long time, even through with our ancestors way before, but it has been pressed down because conflict brings money, right? And if I'm going to charge three hours of a mediation and compare to a lawyer that would take years to resolve an issue, what are my chances, right? What are my chances? And on top of that, people are programmed already that attorneys are the ones that resolve conflict. They don't even think that there's a field that doesn't have anything to do necessarily with the law. And a lot yeah. of attorneys are jumping into the field to bring the service of mediation in their field and people get confused right? mm -hmm. saying oh a mediator it's an attorney when sometimes i would hear many times that people don't get the experience of working in in, in collaboration with other people in those type of mediations because once again attorneys they're trained as an adversarial they're trained to defend people so it is very difficult for them to become neutral and well, neutrality, it's a skill that you need to not only work within yourself, but be able to train on it. Mm -hmm. You said from that skill set is now the behavioral modification. The behaviors have been so rewarded that they don't want to let go. They don't see the danger. They don't see what's the output that they're putting out. And when we know that behaviors create muscle memory, right? So it takes a little bit of a time to get them to work with those behaviors so that they start adopting, they start seeing the opportunity that if you still treat people nicely and, and you become a servant leader, you are going to get the most out of people. And oh, you know gosh. what? This is a great opportunity to see once again that happening because the previous recession, when they study the businesses that succeed, were those businesses that were good to their employees. Yeah. Why? And I think because that, employees become loyal. I saw that yes. since I was little. Yeah. You know, my father employees were so loyal to my dad that they will protect the family and they will protect the business like if it was theirs. I think that is a great place, I think, for us to wrap up because I think when we have an opportunity to develop humans and build relationships, we set ourselves up for success. So whether in corporate and you have a team there or you're an entrepreneur and you have a team that you're working with, even if you're working virtually together, I think this is so important to really connect on that emotional level to build the relationships so that if a conflict arises, you can actually have conversations around that. And I, this is, we're so short on time right now, but I want to emphasize that this is not only in the business place, this is actually across all sectors. So if you're yes. talking about religious beliefs, if you're talking about political beliefs, there are so many instances now where we have such extreme differences that nobody's coming into the middle to have conversations. So this is a good opportunity to really open people's minds to the fact that it is not a silo. It is about being willing to emotionally respond to other people in a kind, generous way that a graceful way and build those relationships and accept differences so that they don't end up being a conflict or ruining relationships or ruining or destroying opportunities. Okay, Yvette, we've talked so much and I love everything that you said. Will you tell the listeners where they can connect with you and learn more about the book? I will put the link to the book in the show notes. So listeners, if you're interested in learning more about how you can change your neural pathways and change how your mind is thinking and how you have been historically approaching conflict. And I will say firsthand, I've never been good at handling conflict. I tend to avoid it and just please instead. And that's not the best way to be either. So oh, I think it's really important to tap into this, this information. So if you want to purchase the book, I'll put the book in the show notes and Yvette, tell everyone where they can find you. Yes, if anybody would like to set up a consultation with me, they can look me at at unitiveconsulting.com. They also can Google my name and they can find my YouTube videos. I am, I have not only published my book, The Conflict Intelligence, but I also have published another book where I was a co-author and it was one of the bestsellers in Amazon. 
And I have also written a lot of articles in many magazines and in publications. So if they Google my name, they'll be able to find my YouTube channel, my Instagram, LinkedIn. Yeah, you can connect on LinkedIn. Yeah. And I will be more than happy to set out time to do a consultation, you know, free of awesome. charge for them to ask me questions and see whether if I can be of any service and value. Another thing is that I am in the midst of developing a full-blown series of teaching conflict intelligence to professionals and organizations as well from the book. Awesome. That's so great. I'm going to leave everyone with this quote. The most profound personal growth does not happen while reading a book or meditating on a mat. It happens in the throes of conflict. When you are angry, afraid, frustrated, it happens when you are doing the same old thing and you suddenly realize that you have a choice. That is from Veronica to Galiba. I probably yes. butchered that name, but one, that's one it. of those and that quotes is a, the book. Yes, yes, that is a quote from the book. And the book has quotes at the beginning of every chapter, and they're also great. But I love that one because at the end of the day, we do have a choice and the choice to take action and step into a new perspective in your own life is so incredibly critical. So for growth and for opportunity going forward. With that, we are going to end this episode. Yvette, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. I appreciate, Robin, the opportunity to talk to your audience. Yes, absolutely. It was a pleasure to have you.